So writing test benches to go along with Verilog, that's a whole nother layer on top of trying to learn Verilog and trying to learn the tools and that kind of stuff. And everybody seemed to implement test benches successfully, which was awesome. Um, so I'm really happy with, with where people are on, uh, on Verilog and the tool chains and such. So let me just run through some of these labs, which I've moved around, so i got to find them. Hold on. Lab 7. All right, so Lab 1 was, was copy and paste code write or type it in verbatim. This should do a logical AND operation. Um, and then wire up a test bench to go ahead and drive that. And I think everybody um, got exactly what they should have out of that. So, um, you know, feed in two ones, you get out of one, otherwise you get out of zero. Um, and you get a timing diagram um, from GTK Wave. So 8-bit um, even parity generator. So let me just mention something here. This was, I didn't word this totally well. Um, the system will accept 8-bit data and output to one if there are an even number of ones. So that's not exactly what we mean by even parity. So let me, let me just, because you'll encounter parity down the road, let me um, nail down some terminology here. So 8-bit numbers, right? So 8-bit even parity. So there's your 8 bits. This means we're going to add a ninth bit, which we call a parity bit. And the goal is that if you look at all 9 bits, the total number of 1s should be even. That's really what we mean by even parity. So for example, if your number is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, the number of 1s is 0. 0 is an even number. Our parity bit should also be a 0. If your number was 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 4 1s, that's an even number. Parity bit should be a 0. If your number is something like 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, three ones, that's an odd number. How do you make the total number of ones even? Make your parity bit a 1. So if you're generating even parity on 8-bit numbers, you really want to count up the number of ones. And if that number is odd, you want your parity bit to be a 1. Okay. So if someone stops you on the street and says, I'll give you a million dollars if you can tell me what even parity is, right, go back to this. But that's kind of opposite from what the lab actually said. So the lab actually said um, that the circuit you're building should output a 1 if there's an even number of 1s. And that's actually the opposite of what you want, because here I've got an even number of 1s. My parity bit should be a 0. So the circuit you were building in the lab, you would complement that to get your parity bit, for example. So I just want to mention that. Um, but yeah, so the goal is, is basically count up the number of ones, and if it's an even number, then for that circuit output, a one. What yeah? Would, I, was, I was doing this. What parallel function would you use to actually be able to count the number of ones? So there's a few ways to do it, but the easiest way to do it is just um, add up each of the bits. So if you're um, taking in your number, and your eight bits are, say, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, right? You can do something like A plus B plus C plus D. That's the sum of those. And there's a modulus operator, percent sign, which says divide this by two in this case and give me the remainder. So if you divide a number by 2 and the remainder is 0, that's an even number. If the remainder is 1, that's an odd number. So if this thing is equal to 0, then you would assign the output to be a 1. 
otherwise a zero. So you could use a, a ternary operator, assign out equals, this thing percent two equals zero. And if it's equal to zero, assign a one, otherwise assign a zero. So that's probably the easiest way if you know how to use the question mark, the ternary operator. You can also get this with exclusive ORs, right? So if you take A and you XOR it with B, you get uh, uh, zero if they're the same, right? So just look at an XOR table. And it looks like this. Well, in this first row, your number of uh, ones is even, right? Zero. And in this row, your number of ones is even. And in these two middle rows, your number of ones is odd. So when you XOR two numbers, the result is a one if you have an odd number of ones. And you can XOR all eight of your bits together. And you might need to throw an inverse at the very end. But that'll basically do the same thing. It'll tell you if you have an even number of ones or an odd number. All right, and then the up-down counter um, didn't see a whole lot of, of challenges with that, um, a whole lot of problems with that. Um, So do your registers, your module, your input, output, all that kind of stuff. But suppose you have an 8-bit register called count, right? So, and is this positive edge? Um, rising edge of the clock. So you could do something like this. So what do we want to do with the positive edge of the clock? We want to either increment count or decrement it. Okay. So you've got some other input. Um, let's just call it up and say one means count up, zero means count down, for example. So you could do something like this. If up equals one, set count equal to count plus one. Otherwise, set count equal to count minus one. There's syntax errors in here, I'm sure. Um, but that's, that's a basic idea, right? Evaluate this variable, which tells you am I counting up or down. If it's equal to one and we say that's the up direction, then just increment count, otherwise decrement count. And this is really all you need. Right, because if count is an 8-bit register and it's got this value and you say add 1 to that, it's going to roll over to this. Right, technically it's a 1 followed by 8 zeros, but it's only got 8 bits, so it's just going to flip over and you're going to end up with this. And if you take this and you subtract 1, you're going to end up with that value that has all 1s in it. Right, now you can put in extra statements like if count is equal to 0, then set it to that otherwise and that's fine. A good synthesizer will actually ignore that part of your code, right? It won't actually build extra circuitry because it will understand that that's doing the same thing as just subtracting one from count. Um, but here's something to be aware of. So suppose you have two variables, up and down. And when you want to count up, you set the up variable to 1. When you want to count down, you set the down variable to 1. So you could do something like this, the usual always block, if up equals 1, count is assigned to count plus 1. If down equals 1, 
count is assigned to count minus one. That probably will not synthesize. You'll probably get errors when you try to compile that. Because potentially up and down could both be equal to one, and you're saying simultaneously I want to set count equal to this plus one and I want to set count equal to this minus one. And you got two different statements trying to assign different values to this register called count, and you can't do that. It's not sensical, right? And the compiler will notice that and it will probably complain and say multiple drivers of that net or something cryptic like that. So we could get around this by using an else statement, which would say if up is one, we're gonna count up. Otherwise, we're gonna see if down is one. And now if they're both one, up takes precedence. Or we just have a single variable up, one equals up, zero equals down. And now you can't be specifying both at the same time. And this is usually what you find in actual devices. Mm -hmm. uh, case statements should get around this because that's basically a bunch of if else's. Okay. So that should work. And sometimes you see inputs labeled like this. Like up slash down with a bar on top of the down. And that's a shorthand which tells you this is a signal which can specify we want to count either up or down. If we put in a one, it's saying we're counting up. If we put in a zero, it's saying we're counting down. Right, so this can be interpreted as two different ways. Either it's the up signal, one means count up, or it's the not down signal, and a zero means down, a one means not down, which is up. So you'll see this combined terminology sometimes where you see something slash something else with a bar, and it's just saying you've got something like this. There's all kinds of little shortcuts when you read data sheets. You'll see, you'll see things like that. And they're, they're just kind of established shortcuts that make it a little quicker to read some of these specs. All right, shift register, really good work. Um, and we went through this last time. If you have eight registers, say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, right, you can make a shift register by a series of statements like this. And since it's happening simultaneously, all of these simultaneously chunk over into the left side, and that shifts everything down one spot. Um, and you do that at, you know, pause edge clock or whatever. So experiment four um, looked fine for most everyone. Experiment five, so this is where you're looking for five of 16 events. So you're going to have a 16-bit shift register. And you could go A, B, C, D, e, F, G, right, all the way through uh, P. Um, but you can also do an array. So you can do a register 15, 0 data for example and now you've got 16 variables that all kind of sound the same and this is actually a little quicker to write code for so data 15 is assigned from 14 data 14 from 13 and so on but this question of 5 out of 16 so you want to know when 5 events um, were a logic 1 all 16 events are stored in these 16 registers. So you might have a 0 and a 0 and a 1 and a 1 and some zeros and 1s inside and so on. And you want to know five of those are 1. You could make a horrible if statement, right, and list all the possible ways that five of these could be 1, but that's a ridiculous if statement, right? The sneaky, slick way to do this is just add up all 15 values. Since it's either a 0 or a 1, if you add off all of these 16 values and the sum is equal to 5, exactly 5 of them must have been 1. So now you can just say something like um, assign out equals write all this out. If that's equal to 5, 
and assign your output to either a one or a zero. Yeah. Is there no shortcut to just add up all of the elements of one array? I think you can make a for loop around it oh, okay. and do that, but but it gets into dangerous territory because you can have variables in your Verilog code that aren't actually synthesized into hardware. They're just used for controlling things like for loops. Um, and you don't want to actually uh, build hardware to code up a for loop. You could. Um, but it's always good to write long Verilog statements. It makes you feel productive. So this is an assign statement, right? This constantly updates the value of out based on what's in these 16 bits of your shift register. You can also do this in an always statement, right? You could make your output a register and you could say if this is equal to 5, then out arrow 1, else out arrow 0. Very slight difference in behavior of those two, and I'm not going to get into it right now, but um, sometimes when you do this, it looks like your output actually lags by one clock cycle. You put in five ones, but it's not until the following clock cycle that you actually see the output change to a one. And that has to do with the fact that all of these are happening in parallel, including that final assignment where you say, if this is equal to five, out arrow one, else out arrow zero, right? It's actually doing that before these things actually get shifted in. So if you saw weirdness where you're off by one, let me know and we can go through your code. But, um, but close enough. So, um, so yeah, this looked good. Saw some cool new experiments. Um, and good lab write-ups. So um, just a few quick comments on lab write-ups. Um, in general, try not to paste screenshots into your code unless really necessary. Now, if you're using GTK Wave, you've got a waveform on your screen, you've got to take a screenshot and paste it in your lab. There's no way around that. But when you're writing code, you can copy that code and paste it as text into your document. That's a whole lot easier to read, right? As opposed to taking a screenshot of your window where you've got your code that you're editing, um, or taking a picture with a phone or something like that. So screenshots, yeah, if you need them, definitely use them. Um, and on Windows, if you just hit the print screen button, that copies uh, an image of the screen into the clipboard. If you go into Word, you can just control V and it'll paste a screenshot. And it'll have the full resolution of the screen. Um, but for plain text, and this will come up in 270 because we always have code and we have screenshots. Um, so for the code, if you just drag it over with the mouse, right, to select it, copy it, and then paste the text into um, your lab report that works well. Um, play around with fonts. If you use a font like Curry or New, that's um, a fixed spacing, so things will line up, right? Text like this, each letter takes a different amount of horizontal space. So if you have code where you've lined up everything and you've got all your comments lined up and stuff, and you paste it in a font like this, it comes out all wiggly and waggly, right? If you change the font in the editor to something like Curry or New, um, that's a fixed spacing font. Everything will line up again nicely. So these are just things to play with as you're, you're doing reports. Like I say, in 270, you'll be pasting a lot of code into your reports. So stuff to mess with. Um, same thing if you want to be able to manipulate images. Find your favorite tools. Um, I actually like a tool for Windows called Urfin View. It's free for non-commercial use. It's really small. It's very fast, and it does everything. Um, it eats most types of image files. It'll let you rotate. It'll let you scale. It'll let you invert the colors, change it to black and white, all kinds of stuff. It's just one of those toolkit things that's useful to have. And you can crop and grow and shrink and so on. So keep, keep developing your toolkits, right, basically for writing reports, because you'll be doing that, you know, forever. Um, so any any questions about um, either the homework or the lab? Lab seven. Oh, the intersection. Are we going to go over that? Lab eight. No. Oh. Lab seven. Uh, oh, the homework. Oh, Where we did the traffic homework. intersection. Yeah. 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 Um. Because I just ended up doing a bunch of if else statements. 
That's really all it is. Oh, that is. Okay. Um, I was thinking maybe I was doing the wrong way. So, did I show you the code I had for that last time? I know we talked about it and we spec'd it out. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, you can think of it as six states. And it's really, if you're in this state and there's a car here and there's no cars there, then we're going to go to a yellow light. And yeah, it's just a bunch of ifs. So how many people here are thinking about doing lab eight extra credit? I know you already did it. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so let me run through um, the tool chain, and I'm I'm still on Linux here, but um, I have the relevant pieces of software and the files on a flash drive, or you can ask Vlad nicely and he might give them to you. Um, but let me run through kind of the start to finish, writing a Verilog module, making a programming file, uploading it into the board, and warning you up front, this may not work, it doesn't always work, right? Um, but theoretically, this will be fine. Um, so let me bring up my tool chain. And let me actually see what I posted on Canvas because if this stuff isn't up there, it should be. I seem to get logged out when I move from one room to the other. Alright, so this is not published. Okay, it's published now. So this document will describe everything that we're going through right here. So I'll point you to some of it in here, but I'll also go through it a little bit quickly. So let's make a totally new project. And I'm just going to call this EMJR250 Spring 19 Demo 17. And all right, so file new project. Um, on the project settings page, so these you have to set up, and it's just, it's hunting through, but it'll remember these defaults once once you do it once. So, family is Spartan 6. That's the type of chip that's sitting in the middle here. Okay, Spartan is an affordable line of FPGAs as opposed to some of the thousand dollar ones. Um, and Spartan 6 was, I guess, their sixth generation. Um, I used to use a Spartan 2. So, um, faster behavior, more gates inside, and so on and so forth. So Spartan 6. Um, the particular model of the Spartan 6 is the XC6 SLX9. And you can go to Xilinx's website, you can find a data sheet for this, and it'll tell you all about what's inside here and so on. Um, it comes in a variety of packages. So this physical package is a square container with all these little tiny pins going around the outside. Okay, that's sometimes called a quad flat pack. So TGQ, TQG144, 144 pins, and TQG specifies the physical shape. So all three of those have to be specified, and they have to be correct. And if you put in the wrong type of chip, you can actually smoke the device. Um, 
because it may program it to do something different. And then preferred languages of Verilog. So these are already set up for me because I've already done this, but basically you have all these uh, families to choose from, so Spartan 6, and then different devices to choose from, and then a few different packages. And the packages, for example, there's an FTG256 package that's going to have 256 pins on it. More pins means you have more things that you can send information out of or get them in, in from. So more ways you can connect to external devices. 144 is fewer, but it's easier to wire up on a board like this. So, so lots of design decisions that people make. Speed doesn't matter, you can just leave it at minus three. It's the default speed rating. And then preferred language should be Verilog instead of VHDL. So those are the only things you have to set up here and you have to set them up once. And they'll remember that afterwards. And then click through to next and say finish. And you've got nothing here except something with that part number and package number on it. Okay, so what should we build? Let's build something we can do lights on. You want to build a multiplier? Okay, so we'll make something that multiplies two-bit numbers. So, A1, A0, B1, B0. And two-bit numbers, what's our largest two-bit number? Three. Two bits. Two bits. So two bits would be one one, that's the number three. Oh. But there's four possible numbers. <laughs> All right, so three is our largest number. Largest product is nine, which we need four bits for. So we could have product three, product two, product one, product zero. So four in, four out, right? Um. All right, so right click on this, say new source, and say new Verilog module and pick a file name. I have a suspicion, there's some religion that gets into this. My current religious inkling is that it's better if you don't name everything the same base file name. Okay, so I called my project something ridiculous. Um, so my main name, I'm just gonna call this main. And I'm going to stick to lowercase. Okay, that's another ritualistic thing. So I'm gonna call this main. And so here's our wizard where we're basically setting up our inputs and outputs. Okay, so I'm going to have an input called A. And that's going to be two bits. So it's going to be a bus. The most significant bit will be bit one. The least significant will be bit zero. So this is A bracket one, A bracket zero. And then B will also be a bus. Goes from one to zero. And then let's call our output product and that's going to be an output, and that's going to be a bus, and that's going to go from bit 3 to bit 0. So that's basically describing to the tool this picture. Right, A, B, and product. Well, I called it P there, but product. Um, and then I'm just going to say next, and that's just confirming my choices. So input, input, output, buses, say finish. Now we've got a module. All right, well, there's our one line of Verilog code, assign product equals A star B. So Verilog knows how to multiply, hopefully. Um, and it says multiply those, take the result of that multiplication, assign it to this 4-bit register called prod. So that's all we need for um, for our Verilog. All right, so next thing, let me see where this goes. It should be pin assignments. I don't want to build a test bench. We're just going to assume that we know what we're doing and this is going to work fabulously. And so we're going to skip ahead to programming the FPGA. But first, let's, um, let's go ahead and build this. 
So that little green arrow over there starts a number of things happening. So this is what's called the synthesize step. So it's got a series of, of programs that it's running and then it comes back. Uh, XST completed successfully. It's still doing something. Okay, so now it's um, it's implementing the design so there's a translate, a map, and a place and route. So these are different versions of taking your original Verilog, right, figuring out how to turn it into a bunch of gates, and then figuring out how you use the particular gates that are available inside here. Okay, so mapping it to this, and then figuring out where to place those gates in here and how to build the connections between them. That's the place and route phase, usually the most complex one. Got green check marks next to all of those steps. Um, I'm good to go. Down here at the bottom it said uh, post place and route static timing completed successfully. That was the final timing analysis. So I can come in here to tools and I can do my schematic viewer technology start with the top level and we can see this again right the picture of our built circuit so the circuit implemented looks like this there's our four inputs B0 A0 B1 A1 there's our four outputs and there's four lookup tables truth tables that are being used to generate each of these four bits and if we look at one of those right this was this thing we saw before where it's just some random looking circuit equations, truth tables, k-maps. But if you think about this, right, you could write a truth table for what each of these outputs should be. There's 16 possibilities here, and for each of those, multiply those two two-bit numbers, figure out what your four output bits should be. You've got a truth table with four inputs, four outputs, four sets of equations, right? One for P0, P1, P2, P3. Well, that's what the software has done and it came up with these equations, so this is the equation for whatever I clicked on, P2, right? And then it builds this circuit to implement it. And so this basically multiplies. There's no multiplier inside here, it's just a bunch of random logic, right? But the effect is you get out the product of A and B. All right, so we want to actually program this device. So we've got, I shouldn't have closed that. We've got stuff inside our device so that whatever values come in B0, A0, B1, A1, right? They go through these circuits and they come out to these four outputs. But we want to connect these switches down here to drive A0, B0, A1, B1. And we want to take these outputs and connect them to four of these LEDs sitting here on the bottom. So we need to tell the software to not only implement this circuitry inside the chip, but to make sure that these inputs come from wherever these switches are connected and the outputs go to wherever they have to go to connect to these LEDs. So here's where, where theory and reality meet, which is good. Um, so, and I'm going to show you how this works, but you don't need to do this. But here's a schematic of this board. Okay, there's the Spartan 6. And there's a power supply, which you get by plugging this into a USB port. There's some voltage regulation that takes place. There's a microprocessor called a PIC 18F 14K50. That's like a processor you'll play with in 270, which is partially responsible for programming this chip. So when I plug this into a USB port and I run software on here, I'm actually talking to that microprocessor and the microprocessor is programming the FPGA. So there's lots of support circuitry in here. Um, if I come down, there's details on the voltage regulation and so on. Here's a PIC processor. 
here's a little piece of flash memory that we can load some things into so that um, each time we plug this board in it remembers how it was programmed um, and here's the actual Spartan 6 chip so it's got all these pins on the sides and if I look over here there's four lines here labeled SW0, 1, 2, and 3. Those are the four switches. And they're sitting next to the numbers 124, 23, 21, and 20. Those are the pin numbers on this 144 pin chip that those switches are connected to. So if I know that association, and similar, the eight LEDs right below the switches, LED 0 through 7, are connected to pins 119, 118, 117, and so on, Right, those are the physical pin numbers on here that go to those LEDs. So if I know those, I can tell the software, hey, connect A0 to pin 124, connect A1 to pin 123, and so on. Okay, now somebody's already figured this out for us, so we don't need to refer to the schematic, but sometimes, right, all you've got is a schematic and you've got to make this association yourself. So one of the files on this flash drive that I can loan you is this configuration file. And it's just line after line after line that basically has these pin mappings. So LED 0 goes to pin 119, LED 1 is pin 18, and so on. Switch 0 is pin 124, switch 1, and so on. So I'm just going to grab these. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to right click on our, our part number. We're going to say new source and we're going to say implementation constraints file. And I'm just going to call this pins. And I'm going to paste part of that file into here. And the number sign starts a comment. So all of this is commented out right now. So I'm going to remove these number signs. And so this is switch 0, 1, 2, 3. So I'm going to set this up to be A1, A0, B1, B0. Okay, so this is switch 0, switch 1, switch 2, switch 3. So I can put in one 2-bit number here, one 2-bit number here. And let's just take these four rightmost LEDs and use those for our output. So our LEDs, um, this is LED 0, LED 1, LED 2, LED 3, and we're going to call that product 0. Through product 3. Alright, so switch 0 is supposed to be A bracket 0, so I'm going to call this A bracket 0. This is going to be A bracket 1. This is B0. And this is B1. And these switches are push button switches. They're switches that electrically look like this. And if we go back to the schematic, we'll see that one of these sides is connected to ground. And this goes to, um, to the FPGA. And we know from doing labs that this isn't a good way to build a switch. right? To make this thing actually work like a switch, we need a 1K resistor going up to VCC. Okay, this is called a pull-up resistor. And the purpose is it pulls the voltage up to 5 volts, for example, unless you pull the voltage down by closing the switch. So if the switch is open, instead of just floating, this resistor pulls it up to 5 volts. And we can say we want that pull-up resistor to be there by putting this word pull-up on the same line where we specify the switch. So this is saying, go ahead and connect a 1K resistor to the input on this switch. It's taking care of that for us. Okay, let's make some LEDs. 
So prod three, prod two, prod one, and prod zero. And this one should not say pull up. I don't know why it does, but it's in the file. So we're going to get rid of that. And I'm going to change these to 24. This is basically how much current we wanted to put out, and 24 is going to be brighter than 8. But that's possibly not something you have to do. It might just be a ritualistic thing. All right, so this is called a constraint file. This is basically connecting the signals in our Verilog code, okay, product 0123, A01, B01, connecting those to specific pins on the FPGA. So I'm going to save this. All right, so I'm going to rerun this. And again, this is all stuff that's on this sheet. So this tells you how to get the constraint file. Um, and there's an example of it in here. And then we're going to rebuild all of this. So it's translating maps, doing place and route. Okay, place and route is done. So the extra step for this is to generate a programming file. And here's one more step you have to do one time per project. You have to right click this, go to process properties, and then check the box that says generate, uh, create binary configuration file. Because we want the bin file, not the bit file. So check the bin file, say apply OK. And now just double click where it says generate programming file. And we got a green question mark, we're good to go. So at this point, if I look in this directory where I did all of this work, which for me was Xilinx Webpack Engineering 250 Spring 19, I should have a file called um, main.bin um, sitting right here. Okay, that's the actual file that's going to get used to program the FPGA. And it's gibberish to us, right? It's a bunch of binary code, 30, 341,000 characters worth of gibberish. but it means something to the FPGA. All right, so the last step is to actually program that, what we call a bit stream, into the FPGA. And if you're on Windows, then you want to run this program called mimisconfig.exe. That's the one that we ended up with. Um, I'm on Linux, so I'm going to do this a different way. But the appearance is pretty much the same. OK, so before I do that, I'm going to plug this in. So on Windows, you'll get a file a window for your port, and you choose COM3 or COM4, or whatever COM port it's assigned it to. For Linux, it's TTYACM0. Speed, you can take whatever the default is. So um, programming file, so I'm just going to browse through my file system. And I'm going to go to engineering250, and I'm going to pick main.bin, and open that up. And I'm going to say program board. And while it's doing it, while it's programming it, this light will be on, and it actually flickers a little bit. And you get a progress bar. And I also checked this box up here, which said verify after programming. So after it loads all of this in, right, quarter of a million bits, 
it's going to read it back and compare it to what it loaded in to make sure that it actually programmed successfully. So it'll go through this and it'll do a quicker progress bar to verify. And then we'll see if it works. So it thinks it programmed. And it says programming done. And I don't think that worked, which is really sad. Um, but that's the process. So that's a good time for a break. Mm -hmm. And I'll see if I can get it to work in five minutes before you come back, and then I'll tell you what the secret was. But those, those are the essential steps. Um, and I'll see if I can figure this out.